Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Everybody, Tom Woods here. Welcome back to The Tom Woods Show, episode 2417. I don't know what I feel like I have to prove here, Clint, <laughs> churning these things out, but, but here we are. I'm very glad to be joined by Clint Russell of Liberty Lockdown, who has just, you know, I know I've talked about this the last time you and I talked, but just uh, like a rocket, just catapulted <laughs> out of nowhere and now is like a central figure in our circle. So, uh, Clint, welcome to the show. Sir Woods, my liege, I'm at your service. Uh, you're good. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the invite back. Well, you're a good man. You, you know, I, I've, when you produce all these episodes, I was doing it five days a week f- for a while. I used to be super sensitive to make them all as evergreen as possible. I, I, you know, sometimes I do current events, but I want people to be able to go back and listen to episode 507 mm-hmm. if they want to, and it's still got something fresh to say to them. But I, I'm not sure that's been the best approach because I don't know how many people go back and actually listen to episode 507. Uh, by the way, I don't know what episode 507 is, but they're all good. They're all, they're all worth listening to. <laughs> but, so, but today I thought I would, I have been diving a little bit more into, into current events and sometimes, sometimes from 1,000 feet in the air. So like, for instance, I had a guy on a couple of weeks ago talking about the theology behind the rapture and Christians in Israel and the Jewish people in the end times and all that. Because people have been kind of hinting at that, but nobody that I've seen has actually delved into it in a whole episode. So sometimes instead of just doing the, uh, you know, the, the little details of what's going on day to day, sometimes I'm trying to look at the, the, the bigger picture. But today, let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's go into some, some details. So first of all, in order to situate the kinds of questions I want to ask you, how would you describe yourself like philosophically and has that changed at all over the past few years? And this is a safe space, Clint. You can say anything you want. I mean, I, I don't think that I've evolved dramatically in terms of ideology or philosophy. Um, I just realized a hell of a lot more people don't share my beliefs than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that that was that was really the the major change is that like I was a much more optimistic about humanity type of person. Um and now I'm a little bit less so. However, uh, I've also had, you know, such an incredible change in my life trajectory where I, I'm interacting with so many more people that that do share my values. So, uh, and I'm also seeing, you know, enormous audiences for uh, discussions that would have never received the types of audiences that they get today. So I think that there is a sign that more and more people are interested in in our belief system and what we have to say. And you know, libertarian anarcho-capitalism. That's broadly you know, what I'm talking about, uh, non-interventionism. That's also one that I, I thought we had woken up the, the MAGA crowd on with the America first spiel and now Israel struck and suddenly that's out the window. So, um, you know, it's a teeter totter. Uh, <laughs> I go through optimistic and pessimistic, uh, phases, but in, in terms of, you know, actually changing my belief system, I don't think it's changed tremendously. Well, it's, yeah, I think your answer is exactly the way I'm thinking because uh, you're right. I, especially after COVID, I, I realized that things that I just t- assumed everybody would agree with me on. Now, I, I get not everybody's on board with privatizing the lighthouses, Clint. You know, fair enough. But but even when I would present the most reasonable, obviously reasonable stuff that that I believe in, even that is being met with skepticism. And, and after years of being told crazy and counterproductive and idiotic things, they still want to honor Dr. Fauci. I can't help. I can't help those people. But you're right that at the same no. time, there are definitely more people than ever asking the right questions. So that sometimes, the, you know, sometimes that comment section drives you to despair. But other times, that comment section makes you think, wow, absolutely nobody who really thinks about things is going for Nikki Haley. You know, absolutely nobody is believing this story that, uh, I forget the, the name of the, the Pfizer head, but you, you know who I mean. He puts Albert a tweet Gorla. out. He doesn't even dare allow comments, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I guess that has to be some source of encouragement. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Albert Borla, I, I believe is the CEO that yes, you're referencing that's the guy for Pfizer. Yeah. Uh, look, I think that in many ways, like, especially in the, in the Twitter world, for whatever reason, it feels like we kind of dominate, which is fascinating because I, I wouldn't. I mean, I I don't know any other area of life that we dominate. (laughs) That's right. I'll take it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But we have, we have one arena where we seem to be very successful. And, you know, I think that there's also, 
you know, particularly, um, you know, my generation and younger, like the, the people that actually fought in the, the war on terror, uh, I think that many of them, even if they come from a more Republican or even an evangelical backdrop, they're just done with this. Like they're just, they, they realize that they've been deceived so much when it comes to the propaganda to get them into the, the wars that many of them fought in, or they at least had a relative that fought in, uh, that it's, they're far more skeptical of the propaganda push for the next good war, the next moral war. Uh, and I think that that's fantastic progress. Uh, obviously I wish, I wish it was going a little bit faster seeing as there's multiple fronts for world war that are potentially in the offing. Um, but I think if you look at the recruitment rates for the military, uh, if you see how, you know, neocons that try to run for president are abused and laughed off the stage largely, uh, Vivek Ramaswamy, who I just interviewed again with Luke uh, Rudkowski last week, uh, we got him the day after he was on that debate stage, just blasting Nikki Haley and DeSantis and Christie and everybody else that wants to see eternal war. I, you know, whether you believe Vivek is the real deal or not, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I love to see neocons just uh, scolded. And what matters, again, because I, I get people saying, well, I don't trust him because of this or I don't like him because of that. But the real story here is there's somebody who thinks it's to his advantage to say these things. Exactly. You know, that's the interesting thing. You know, on, on the, the issue of military recruitment and stuff, I sometimes feel like, I, I don't know that they're, I don't think they're doing this on purpose, but it's a, it's a side benefit to the regime that almost everybody knows somebody in the military. You got somebody in your extended family who's in it or has been in it or your next door neighbor or your coworker or whatever. And so that pulls you in, I think, to it makes it harder for you to 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 stand up against it all, you know, to to be to be a, a, a full-fledged dissident on it because you kind of identify with the military. Oh, my my old friend Joe is in there. And right. and so the, it, it's made it hard for people to to, to see these things clearly. Now, on, on Veterans Day, I didn't try this out yet, Clint. I don't know why. It's not that old Woods is, is getting soft here, but I, I, you know how everybody's always saying, thank you for your service? My hmm. line is, you're welcome for my tax dollars. Now, I didn't try <laughs> that out on, on Veterans Day, but next year, next year, that's the line. Well, I, I, wish, you, I wish you well in that. Um, you know, I, I've always, be, I, I grew up in San Diego for those that don't, aren't familiar. And, um, you know, I lived right next to Camp Pendleton, which has, you know, lots of Marines and, and just military, uh, veterans broadly all throughout San Diego, tons, Navy, every, everything, uh, played beach volleyball with a bunch of these guys. And I mean, they're really good people. I, I think, so I, I really go out of my way not to offend these guys. Cause ultimately, like if we end up in some sort of hot conflict domestically, like I, I hope that these guys will be on the side of good. So I'm like, Hey. You're trained killers. Could uh, <laughs> just remember, I didn't spit on you when you came back from Vietnam uh, <laughs> or, or Iraq or Afghanistan or Syria or Lebanon or, you know, the list goes on and on. Or, or uh, the Mediterranean or, or uh, <laughs> Gaza, wherever they're fighting today surreptitiously. Um, but yeah, I, 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 do, <laughs> I do understand the, the sentiment that also I'm being robbed to pay for their, uh, their bloodshed. And that's not yeah, very Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and the thing is, I, I'm of two minds about that too, because... I've had a lot of people, a lot of people, as Scott Horton has, write to me and say, I got, uh, I got discharged from the military. I got, I was able to do, I, I was able to get uh, status as a conscientious objector or whatever because I listened to you. And if I had said to them, you're all pieces of, you know, right? right. Then I think it would have been less likely they listened to me. So that's why, that's kind of why I hesitate with stuff like that. I mean, I, I don't really hesitate to speak my mind. But I some sometimes I want some things to be heard by some people, <laughs> some things to be heard by others. You know, the other day I was feeling very sentimental, and uh, we have a group chat on our phones with uh, with all the daughters who have phones and my wife and me, and I sent them a link to a Ron Paul compilation video from from about I guess eleven years ago, or maybe, no, well, longer than that. It was from the two thousand eight campaign, and mm. I know, uh, look, that's a long time ago, and and things are different now, but. But I have, I'll, try, I'll put it in the description of the video. It's a, it's a compilation. A lot of people were making Ron Paul compilation videos in those days. They'd take snippets from the debates or things he said in interviews or whatever, and they'd put them together. This one it probably only got like 35,000 views, but it always really moved me because it had Brian Adams singing Can't Stop This Thing We Started. Mm. And it would show, it showed all these people endorsing him. It was all these 
it was all positive pictures of us all happy together, cheering for him. And it, I mean, it almost brought a tear to my eye because I really remember thinking in those days, even though, you know, I guess my brain was telling me they'll never let this guy win or the people aren't ready for this message. But my heart felt like something was happening. You know, something was really happening. And it's, it's sad to me that I don't have that feeling anymore. Were you around for the Ron Paul years? Oh yeah. Big time. Uh, I was, I don't know, 25 years old or something like that when, when 08 was happening. And uh, it was incredible. <laughs> I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, for those that don't know, I was, I'm actually a second generation libertarian. I was raised into this. So for me, it was like all of these taboo concepts were suddenly palatable on a grand scale. And, and I was just like, I had gone through my entire life just arguing with everyone I know about everything and no one agreeing with me about anything. And then all of a sudden it was like, I have a tribe. It felt so good, which is weird because, you know, as an individualist, I'm kind of accustomed to just being a lone wolf. But uh, yeah, I mean, 08 and 12, that, that five-year run was just as, as fulfilling, as spiritually engaging uh, an era as I've ever existed in. Uh, next to maybe this one, because I'm now able to talk to, you know, my heroes and, and do all sorts of cool stuff. I mean, I, I spoke on the DC Steps uh, with Ron Paul just in January. So it's like, I, I ought to feel as if this era is even, uh, you know, more hopeful. But the reality is, is that I really thought that he had a shot of getting in there. As as delusional as that seems in, in hindsight, I, I really thought he had a shot. Well, I think it was that the sheer enthusiasm that our side exactly. had couldn't be matched by anybody. Nobody was even going to cross the street for Mitt Romney. But you've got right. people with Ron Paul signs out in New Hampshire with two feet of snow. You know, or, or, or Michael Moresco riding his bike across the, the length of the United States, passing out Ron Paul literature. And, and I know people looked at him and thought, isn't it great that a cyclist like this would do this? But he, that was the thing. He wasn't a cyclist. He was just a guy who that's bought incredible. a bike. And because yep. that's how, how strongly he felt about it. And then when, when John McCain was getting the coronation from the, RNC, from, from the Republican convention, Ron Paul does the impossible. All the hotel rooms are taken. All the rental cars are taken. There's nowhere for anybody to go. He holds it. He didn't call it this, but I'm calling it this. He holds a counter convention. They were in St. Paul. He was in Minneapolis that same week. And somehow we coordinated. We got 10,000 people to that Target Center in Minneapolis, basically by saying, look, I, I got a, a couch you can sleep on, or I've got this or that. And we made it work somehow. Nobody else was going to do that. And so I think we thought, because there's so much enthusiasm, the people we see, each one of them probably represents a hundred other people. Right. But I think the people we saw were all the voters, basically. <laughs> I think I think there was more than that, but uh, not but, as but many. But you know what that, I mean? Like there wasn't. I think when you found out about Ron Paul, you didn't want to sit on the sidelines like you right. would with Rick Santorum or something. Absolutely. You wanted to get out there and do something. Absolutely. Yeah. No, he was. He was as inspirational. It's funny because he's so, he's such a relatively subdued guy. Yeah. Kind of, you know, uh, you know, country bumpkin professorial almost. And, and you're like, you're like this guy, this guy led a revolution. And you're like, yeah, yeah, he yeah. did. I was there. I was 25. It was insane. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't, it's, it's just, I think the timing and the messenger just aligned, it, you know, just, it, it collided with itself. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember just watching these montages and, and you're right. It was just like nothing but viral Ron Paul clips all throughout the internet for all, all those years. It was just, it was just amazing. So, so many of my friends who, I mean, it's funny because like, even though I'm, I'm accustomed to just having, holding ideas that no one else shares to a large extent, uh, there is just something about like the social proofing aspect of these messages being viral and seeing college kids chant them. And, and having people that are just broadly discussing topics that I've cared about for a very long time that allowed the average person, the non-political type to start to hear me more clearly. Um, it really, it really did. Like, I don't know if it like, if it wrote an entirely new chapter in the book, but it definitely, it turned the page over to a new chapter for us to, to work on, uh, in terms of the, the dialogue with our fellow men. Time for a quick message from our sponsor, Cheeky Maiden Soap. Now, if you could break into my house, which I strongly discourage, by the way, you would find Cheeky Maiden Soap products in my bathroom. And I've been using them for at least several years now. Now, why is that? 
Well, natural soaps like the ones Cheeky Maiden makes are typically made with organic ingredients like plant oils, essential oils, and herbs. So you're avoiding synthetic chemicals and potential irritants found in industrial soaps. In fact, just try to pronounce half the ingredients in those industrial soaps. You sure that's how you want to treat your skin? And here are a few, by the way. Now, I think in grabbing a few of them just now, I think I grabbed the most effeminate sounding ones, but I promise if you need to have soap that's in more of a lumberjack style, they can fix you up with that also. So I got some chai latte soap right here. Lavender soap. I'm not ashamed to tell you I enjoy that one also. Energizing soap. Who couldn't use some of that? Their soaps contain nourishing ingredients that help hydrate and moisturize my skin. They leave it feeling soft and smooth. And natural soaps are often milder and gentler on the skin compared to their industrial counterparts. They don't strip away your skin's natural oils or cause dryness or irritation. Well, it's easier than ever to be like Woods because, because you know me, you now get a discount. Go to CheekyMaidenSoap.com and use code WOODS15 at checkout to save 15% off your next order. That's CheekyMaidenSoap.com and use code WOODS15 to take 15% off your next order. Well, as long as we're on the Ron Paul subject and you've been talking about war, might as well bring it up. It's, you know, I, I had Vivek on the night before the debate. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, and, and, um, and I asked him about, well, what's his opinion of APAC? And I think he sidestepped that one, and probably wisely. He said, I haven't <laughs> had any interaction with them, so I can't say. Well, okay, I haven't had any interaction with them either, but I can still <laughs> but, say, you know what I, I mean? I still have a lot to say about it. I still have, pl I have plenty to say about a lot of people I've never interacted with. <laughs> but Ron Paul shows that it is not inconceivable that you can stand up to them and live to tell the tale. Because he, he didn't go for any of their propaganda for the entire, all the 11 terms he was in office. And he just said, I believe in non-intervention. I don't believe in foreign aid. And that's the end of the conversation. And you can call me any name you want to, but those are my principles. So it, it can be done. And, mm -hmm. and in particular, I think now with, um, even before this whole war broke out, there was a lot of negative attention all of a sudden being cast on the ADL because of their confrontation with Elon Musk. And they're not accustomed to that. I don't think they're accustomed to having to turn off replies on Twitter. They're the ones who are supposed to make us all terrified and say what they want <laughs> us to say. But it, all of a sudden, the tables had been turned. Yeah, I I was, uh, I mean, during the the old ownership uh, period of Twitter, I would block all of these accounts, uh, you know, because I was so afraid of them mass reporting me. They're just seeing something that I I said that they disagreed with the sentiment, and then they they sick their their bot network on you to to mass report you because so many people were losing their accounts. And I don't think that I was unjustified in, in feeling concerned about these people in that way. Uh, they really do function in that fashion. It's a very, it's it's fascinating because. You know, the ADL leads with a message of historical persecution. You know, what what happened to the Jewish people or what happened to this minority class or whatever. Um, but then they persecute people very viciously. And and I think that's actually a good analogy for what's transpiring in Gaza right now, is that this historically oppressed people, which I will grant, Jewish people with pogroms and the Holocaust and everything else, terrible, terrible amounts of persecution for hundreds of years. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that they're now persecuting lots of innocent women and children, lots, and, and, and ending their lives uh, viciously. And I don't even want to apply this to the Jewish people. I'll just say, you know, Israel, IDF, whatever, just to make it more specific. But there is something fascinating about once you, once you feel, you know, righteously aggrieved, what, what sort of just horrific violence is able to be brought to bear without any sort of consideration? And, and I think that's what happened after, you know, October 7th is that, yes, righteously aggrieved. I, still, as a non-interventionist and as an anti-war libertarian, I, I still will speak up for the innocents that are caught up in the crossfire of two warring tribes. And it, it's just, it's heartbreaking to witness. Sorry, I don't even know where we started with that, that question. But I no, just no, no. Well, off. I was talking about uh, APAC and the ADL. And oh, yes. That suddenly it's possible to, it's, it's, it's increasingly possible to resist them. But, but uh, like, for example, Thomas Massey, you saw, was being attacked by them. Uh, yes. They were calling him an anti-Semite. They're going to run ads against him. And he, he stood up and said, look, th 
that stuff doesn't work on this congressman. And I thought I just needed to hear those words from somebody. <laughs> yes, me too. I mean, that's that's why he is he's Ron Paul 2.0 uh, from the congressional level. I think I think he's as close to to Ron as as we've seen. And and let's just be honest: if you're going against Massey, uh, you're definitely on the wrong side of history. This guy this guy is true blue. His principles are are crystal clear. And you know, to accuse him of anti semitism because he's not going to go along with with more uh, military funding is just laughable. I can't remember the guy's name, but I follow. I follow a lot of people on Twitter because of COVID. And then now I'm right. kind of having buyer's remorse. What, wh- which, who are these people I followed? You know, they were good on one thing, it turned out. Turned out. But it's, he's a doctor, and I dug gun, and I can't think of his name, but somewhere buried in my Twitter feed, I responded to this guy. Hmm. Because he tweeted something along the lines of, um, it, it was a pro-Israel uh, tweet, and, and he was saying something along the lines of, after 9-11, Americans didn't say, well, we better try to be surgical and proportional, whatever. Maybe you saw this tweet. Oh, I saw it. I forget and, the doctor's name, but yeah, it was and, and, I, and I responded, I wish we had. It's like, <laughs> no. Wouldn't that have been great instead of acting like complete idiots and morons for 20 years and I mean, bankrupting ourselves and then being worse off than when we started? <laughs> wouldn't yeah. it have been better? Obviously. I mean, that, that's what's so frustrating about this. The, the corollary to the war on terror and, and the, the 9-11 attacks are striking, to put it mildly, in terms of questions about uh, you know early warning signs and and reaction times, and then the the immediate response of well, yeah, we were attacked by Hamas, but it's obviously Iranian proxies that are destroying that are attacking American troops all throughout the Middle East, and I'm like, well, maybe, <laughs> but I don't believe you, people. You've lied to me my entire life. Why would I possibly believe that? that and they never. They never even feel as if it's necessary to, to, you know, proffer any evidence. It's just like, yeah, we, we had uh, some troops that were at our camp in Syria. Oh, we have a camp in Syria. Why? Why do we have a camp in Syria? Oh, uh, there, there was also an attack from Iranian proxies against our troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why? Why are they there? Why? Why is what? Can we have that discussion? We're just going to, we're just going to brush over that. Oh, would you like any evidence? Could you, could you offer me any proof that Iran is funding all of this, that they're funding Hamas. You have a full blockade on Gaza. You have a full blockade. Nothing gets in or, or out without the approval of the IDF. And you're going to tell me that that they're they're receiving all of their fund. No, it's actually through the Qataris. Well, but also Netanyahu funded Hamas, uh, you know, through these cutouts because they wanted to f- prevent a two state solution. It's like it's all so complicated, and it's tried to it, they try desperately to portray it in this. This black and white, you're with us or against us, you're on the side of evil or you're on the side of good. It just, it's just not that way. It's not the truth. And it wasn't the truth after 9 11 when it came to Saddam Hussein. And I assure you, a year, two years from now, we'll look back at this period and we'll realize we were deceived tremendously once again. I want to ask you something else that uh, comes up a lot in our circles, and that has to do with political action. Now, you know that we have people who think either it's immoral to be involved in politics because you are thereby, quote, consenting to the system, or or it's a, it's a waste of time and you should, you should be engaged instead in educational efforts. Um, I think my thinking on this has definitely evolved over time. We'll put it that way. Where are you on this? Mm. I waver, man, (laughs) just to be straight with you. I don't know. Uh, I think that if, if the LP is to exist, then it's, you know, on the federal level, I think that the, the primary funding ought to go to the presidential candidate, because I think that that gives you the greatest opportunity for waking people up, you know, and I think that's a really important thing. However, with the advent of the internet and social media and the capacity for vi- for viral messaging outside of political debates and things like that, uh, you know, like actual presidential debates, I'm not so sure that it's necessary, you know, or it's not as necessary as it once was. Like back in 08, when Ron was running, even though he ran into the GOP, uh, it was still like, that was the only time you were really going to be able to get that message to the normies. And now, you know, Glenn Beck will invite us on, <laughs> you know, uh, Tim Pool, Rogan. There's a whole bunch of platforms that are, are inviting people with our belief system on and so I'm not so sure. Uh, I I still believe that that local action is ultimately where we're headed, and and it's where it's most you know fruitful and most necessary. Um, so I think that you know the the broad Mises Caucus uh, plan 
of you know decentralized revolution is is probably the, the trajectory. The problem is that I don't find that messaging to, to be very compelling. You know, even though I believe in it, there's just something about it that like decentralized revolution is like ah, that's just boring. <laughs> like I know, like you're including revolution, which is a fun, cool word, and then you're like decentralized, and it's like wonky. You know, accountant talk. <laughs> so I don't know. I go back and forth. Where, where are you at? Well, I never really went for the, um, it's immoral to vote. Because I, I don't think that's true. Oh, yeah, I mean, no. Lysander Spooner didn't think it was immoral to vote. And, and no, I don't think self defense <laughs> his libertarian card away. What'd you say? It's self-defense, in my opinion. Self-defense, yeah, exactly. That, w- that was his argument. That if, if you're doing it, like if, if you're in a concentration camp, and I say, uh, all right, and I'm the concentration camp guard, and I say, we're going to have a vote, and uh, we're going to vote on whether you eat steak or gruel, well, I'm voting. I'm going to vote for steak. You know, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, I'm consenting to the system. No, you know what I'm actually doing? I'm making my life better. That's what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I'm not right. consenting to anything. These are the, this is the situation I find myself in. Or if we're going to have a vote, whether we're going to let you out or not. Are, are you saying that on principle, I'm going to vote to stay in the concentration camp so that I won't consent to the system by voting? This is ridiculous. You know, so, know. so, so get out of that. If you don't want to <laughs> vote, don't, but don't give me this whole, it's, it's, it is not immoral, uh, yeah. because you are not, cons- the, it's the left wing idea that you're consenting to everything by casting your vote. We're against that. We don't believe right. that that's true. Um, but the other thing is, in terms of it being a waste of time, the thing is, I, I've never heard it explained to me. And I've asked, I've asked Michael Malice, who, who wrote a whole article for The Observer about what a waste of time it is to vote. I've asked all these pe- people I respect. Well, then what is your, how, how's this, how, what's your scenario by which we get from here to there? You know, mm. and, and I know, and I have agorists in my audience that I love that strategy too, and you can pursue that, but sure. what's the pathway? And I never really get an answer that, well, eventually people will learn enough that something will happen. That's just not specific enough for me. And that's not to say that, you know, the Republican party is going to be your savior, but it, at least on some things, as Rothbard said, on some things, there was no way that simple civil disobedience was ever going to s- solve the problem. To get the second bank of the United States shut down, you needed the president to not renew the charter. You Mm -hmm. know, like there there are certain things that you had to, if you were going to get around tariffs, uh, like in England, well, you needed the repeal of the corn laws. You know, like there's some things required political action. Yeah, I feel like I feel like malice and many in the, you know, hard hardline anarchist camp are essentially like waiting for the Berlin Wall to come down. Like they're waiting for the USSR to just implode upon itself. And obviously the analogy being that America will be the next <laughs> communist empire to collapse. Uh, and may- maybe, you know, but like the reality is there's a, I, you know, all, everyone I know and love practically lives here. And I am very, very concerned about what an outright collapse looks like. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm very, very concerned about what hyperinflation would mean to everyone I know and love. It right. would be devastating. And it doesn't matter that I've told them about Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, it just simply doesn't matter. So, yeah, I, this is why I, I always kind of, I get frustrated with people that, that limit our options or they say, oh, you, no, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be doing this. I don't know what the answer is. If I knew what the answer is, we probably would have already won. Okay. So, like, I am a you know, shotgun blast of a different attempts and different pathways, different avenues, different mediums. Uh, I think it's just all hands on deck. Everybody that, that you're, whatever you're best at, whatever you're most passionate about, go do that as, as a, you know, passionately and as beautifully as you possibly can. And, and if that's getting people to vote, if that's running for city council, if it's running for your sheriff, please be a sheriff. Oh my goodness. I would love that. I would love to go live in your town. Um, if it's running for president, like whatever, whatever it is, if you're, if you're great at it, please, we need everybody participating. What would you say you're most disappointed about when it comes to the libertarian world right now? Oof, man. I mean, I think, you know, honestly, from my vantage point, it's just the politics, <laughs> you know, which is a weird thing to say because I'm talking about a political party. But, you know, I'm, I'm friends with so many of the people that are involved in this at the, at the highest level. Well, levels. it doesn't and have to be the LP. It can be just the, the broad movement, all the sure. libertarians out there. Yeah. I mean, the infighting is obviously very frustrating. It, it's the, the constant like purity testing for, you know, I, I did a debate a couple of days ago and, and 
they were applying purity testing when it came to my belief in, uh, there's a bunch of Afghanistan refugees that have been pushed into, uh, to Pakistan and Pakistan is now pushing them back out. And, and the person I was debating was like, well, you know, Pakistan hasn't properly homesteaded all of that land. So they can't really, you know, justifiably under a libertarian framework evict these people from Pakistan. And I was like, I was like, wait, 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 we're going to apply homesteading rules and laws and principles to <laughs> Pakistan's response to the migration of 1.7 million Afghanistans, thanks to the American empire. And we're not going to talk from, from an American libertarian vantage point. We're not going to focus on the American empire destroying Afghanistan and driving these people there. We're going to actually critique their immigration policies. That's the, that's the, you know, it's just like, it's just the minutia, you know, it's like, it's like people are some about our, our capacity to understand these concepts makes us incapable of messaging them in an effective way. And, and I, I know that's very frustrating to me. Hey everybody, quick message on behalf of our sponsor, Monetary Metals. You have almost certainly heard Ron Paul say that the thing that got him into politics was Richard Nixon closing the gold window in 1971. And ever since Nixon definitively took us off the gold standard, things have just gotten worse. The dollar has lost over 90% of its value since that time. It's become harder for Americans to retire. The national debt just surpassed $33 trillion. Disaster can strike at any time. And so we need a change. Where's that change going to come from? Not from D.C. It has to come from the market. We need a market-based answer to the corrupt, dishonest money we use today. And I think we have one. That answer is monetary metals. Monetary metals enables you to get on your own personal gold standard starting today. Who cares what the Federal Reserve is doing with interest rates when you can earn interest on your gold, paid in gold, earn up to 5% in their gold leasing program, or earn double-digit returns in their gold bonds if you're an accredited investor. I put my own money, my gold, where my mouth is and opened an account with them myself. It's time for you to do the same. Join me and our old friend Jeff Deist as we lead an honest money revolution that starts by opening an account at Monetary Metals today. Go to monetary-metals.com slash woods to learn more. That's monetary-metals.com slash woods. Do you think when you hear a libertarian say the, the, the right is just as bad as the left, that, that that's, a, that's an accurate message? No, definitely not. Um, I, think, I think they both have the same capacity for badness, <laughs> but, but at this current junction, no, I think it's totally delusional to think that, that the right is just as bad as the left. Uh, the left over the past 12 years or so, since the, the woke mind virus took over, I think is an, is an existential threat to me and, and my family, like for, for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the right can obviously get indoctrinated into, into, uh, you know, advocating for military intervention against, um, you know, Hamas like that, that could happen and that'd be ter terrible. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not turning my back and being like, you're, you're an ally I can trust for sure. Uh, but as far as like the most dangerous, I think that the left is the clear and present danger right now. How about this? What do you think libertarianism is wrong about, or if not wrong, has not reckoned with enough that may, maybe hasn't paid enough attention to? Yeah, this is a tricky one. This is like, uh, yeah, this is a, these are some rough questions here, Clint. I know. Yeah, well, I, I love it. Put, put me through the, uh, well, if you want, gamut. I'll give you my answer. Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. So one, one possible answer, I think there are several, but one, one possible answer is I think we were too, um, glib about the distinction between the public sector and the private sector, that the private sector, everything will all work out because of competition. So if there's a terrible employer, well, don't worry. The good employer will attract all the workers away from them. And, and, but, but the, the real, um, enemy you have to focus on is the public sector. And that's where all the badness is going to come from. But I think we've seen that in the private sector, there are some, it, it I should have seen this before, but there really are some rotten employers whose rotten behavior does not seem to be corrected by the market. And that could be whether it's the vaccine policy or firing you for saying something that's obviously true or whatever. Uh, now, I, I don't exactly know what the solution to that is, but I definitely know we weren't talking enough about it. 
Yeah. Well, I, I mean, that's kind of the ESG DEI framework, which is largely led into by government regulations. So it, it's a distinction without a difference. The private yeah, that's industry true. And, and public is like, like, it's very hard to delineate at this point. So I think that's the one thing that, that what you were absolutely right about is like to blanket defend private enterprise is a huge mistake because the vast majority of them at the highest levels, they're not really functioning from a private enterprise level, <laughs> you know, like it's just, it's just not reality at this point. Unfortunately, I wish it were, but it's not, um, you know, I think, I think that we're oftentimes, I, I shouldn't say, you know, broadly the libertarians, but I think that we were wrong about the, the, uh, the amount of debt that the nation could take on, um, but I think that there's a good reason for it and an Austrian economics, you know, explanation for it is that we were exporting our inflation to the rest of the world as the dollar reserve, you know, currency. Um, but I think what, what makes it very unique is that when that reverses, when the, when the U S dollar reserve status is threatened sincerely by, by the BRICS Alliance, uh, I think that it'll, it'll expedite our demise. So it's like, it's going to be a bang moment and a lot of people who have been predicting things, uh, Peter Schiff comes to mind, shout out to Peter, uh, you know, that have been saying it's a year, it's next year, it's next year. And they just keep saying it. Uh, I think that they will eventually be right. And it is going to be, uh, very rapid, but I think we've been, we've been wrong about the amount of debt that, you know, a dollar reserve you know, nation, uh, can accumulate before that happens. All right. I'm going to try to steal man a position here and see what, what your response is. So let's say I'm a well-meaning conservative, like not, not an idiot. I'm not a Mitch McConnell guy. I more or less see the world <laughs> clearly, but I've got some blind spots. And, and I approach you, Clint Russell, and I say, um, you and I have a lot in common and we, we definitely feel put upon by the same bad guys. And so where possible, we should try to see where we can work together. And, and this, let's say this person even says, now I will grant you that my Republican party is, is still full of Mitt Romney people. It's still full of fund the Ukrainians people, full of these people, uh, who, who are going to have the wrong position on a lot of things, who are going to have the wrong position, even on the most obvious things. We have people who are going to stab you in the back all day long, but we still do have a rising group that nevertheless is, uh, a bunch of dissenters from this. We do have some, we at least have, we have an increasing constituency of people who are starting to see the world more clearly. Now, th they're not great on everything. They're going to be China war hawks, just even though they're, they're good on other things, they won't be good on this. But I think some of the party is moving in the right direction. And this is a time when we can't afford to indulge in this vanity project of voting for some ideologically pure libertarian candidate when the future of our kids' souls hangs in the balance. So can't you just drop this vanity project and try and work with the best people we have in the Republican Party to try to salvage something? Yeah, I, I, honestly, it's, it's a fair argument to make. I, I don't think it's an unfair one, but the, the truth is, is that just as in you know, a, a free market, Without competition, your your quality of service declines and the cost of it increases. I mean, that's just like that's just what happens. It's a monopoly monopoly practices. Basically, for for the liberty minded amongst us in America, the GOP has a monopoly on voting for freedom, and they don't deliver freedom. It's a terrible product. So I want to have more competitors that I can actually send my dollars to. And, and receive some of my liberty. Uh, so, you know, th this is the primary argument that I have for why it's important that there is more than a GOP option for, you know, peace and freedom. And because the truth is, GOP doesn't deliver that. They deliver record, uh, you know, budget deficits. And they, they also deliver, you know, as many wars as the Democrats do historically, it seems. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that that's, well, well, I do understand the argument. I think that <clears throat> I think that it's flawed because if you don't hold their feet to the fire, they're not going to do a damn thing for you. Uh, la last thing that, that's on my mind, and, and I ask you this just because you and I follow current events closely, and I think you know each of us has as 
plausible a, a likelihood of knowing the answer as anyone. It seems pretty likely to me that that within a matter of, I don't know how many months, Trump will be a convicted felon. And it'll be for something dumb and that you know, no normal person cares about and it's a kangaroo court. We, we all know that and, and I have no argument with that. The problem is the people who are so dedicated to either Trump or bust don't seem to understand that most of the country thinks being a convicted felon is bad. They're not going to listen to your nuanced explanation about, well, they're actually all against them because of this, that, and the other thing. They, they don't like convicted felons, especially independent voters. And they need independent voters. The, 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 the Trump base is not big enough to win. And so once it doesn't matter what the polls show now. Once he becomes a convicted felon, it becomes very, very difficult for him. Uh, not just because of that albatross, but also because he'll be tied up legally in all kinds of ways. There are all kinds of things they could do to him to make it borderline impossible to campaign. So can you pull out your crystal ball and tell me what do you think happens when Trump is a convicted felon and the likelihood of his being elected is very, very small? Do you have any thought about what the Republican Party does at that point? Well, I, I actually disagree with you on this. Oh, which is please, I'd love to hear. Yeah, uh, and maybe it's just my own bias, <laughs> but I would, like, the only chance Trump has of getting my vote is if he's behind bars. That sounds awesome. I would love to vote for Trump from behind bars. Like, I want the to see a guy. Soccer moms won't, though, Clint. That's I my know, point. I know, but there's a lot of pissed off people, Tom. There's a lot. And I think that there's a lot of people that, like, they they feel even from the left, believe it or not. I think there's a lot of people on the left that that see the system working against them, and like any doubt that you have about Donald Trump's legitimacy, even though like this doesn't really prove it, <laughs> but but it's still from the the you know layman's perspective, it proves that he is a tr a genuine outsider that is functioning and working against the system, and that's really appealing to people who feel as if the system is working against them. And I, and I feel that way. And I think there's millions of people that feel that way. I mean, if you look at the polling, uh, you're, I'll grant you, it's before he has that felon you know, label attached to him. But he's crushing. I mean, he's, he's winning in all the swing states. He's, he's beating Biden you know, handily. So uh, I'm not so sure. You know, I think that there, there are inflection points in, in nation's history where you know, things that, like trends break. Like the things that used to be you know, taboo, you could never imagine. Well, you would never imagine that you'd have the leading presidential candidate under indictment facing 700 years in prison. Like there's just, there's paradigms that are shifting and breaking in real time. Um, so I'm not at all sure that he's not, he's not electable. Uh, okay. Okay. The, you, you make an interesting case. I, it's just that the fights he'll have will be so numerous. Like the, the Republican party establishment is not the same establishment that it was in 2012. Sure. And it, it has, uh, more Trump sympathy, a uh, more populist sympathy than, than it did then. But even so, I, I mean, can you imagine? And not, not that Mitt Romney was going to, you know, lift much of a finger to campaign for Trump, but, 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 but a guy who was on the fence might say, "Well, I, you know, what do you, what do you seriously expect me to do? I'm a respectable businessman, and you want me to go around donating and publicly support to and publicly supporting a guy in pr prison? I can't, I can't do. That. I, so I think he's going to fight no, against the Republican Party. It's going to, I, I don't, yeah. Who knows? Well, I, I just think that like there's there's such a desire to see, you know, uh, that 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 desire that got Trump elected in the first place, the wrench, the bull in the China shop, that instinct is still there. And it's probably increased a lot. <laughs> but, like, here's the truth. If you're an average guy who's looking at Joe Biden as the option, assuming he's he's still the candidate, which I think is a distinct possibility, he will not be. I think Gavin Newsom's the odds on favorite. But the truth is, your life has gotten, you know, exponentially more challenging since Joe Biden's become president, just because of the inflationary pressures. Uh, it, not to mention that hundreds of thousands of people that had their had their, you know, I don't know if they lost their jobs, but certainly had their their jobs jeopardized with the vaccine mandates, uh, which was a Biden directive. So, I think that there's a lot of people that are just going to look at it and say, whatever, I don't care. I like it. They mean you. You may be right as far as like they may not publicly talk about it. They may not be sending campaign funds they may, may not be going out on the stage and speaking for him but i think there's a huge percentage of people especially if the options are biden versus trump they're going to say screw it i'm pulling the lever for trump and let me also say if it's gavin newsom i 
I, as a California refugee, I am so mortified at that guy having a shot at ruling over this nation that like, I would probably have to like actually get out and, and, and campaign for Donald Trump. He, Gavin Newsom is Satan reincarnate. He is, he is one of the worst human beings on the planet, maybe in human history. He is so dangerous. I just, I have to, every time I get an opportunity to emphasize this to people, because I really think he's got a shot at being the next president. You have to do everything in your power to keep him from being the president of the United States. He is so, so dangerous. He will ruin this country if it's not already ruined. I'm being totally sincere about this. It's incredible that he could, he could be such an ego case that he could look at the state of California, the condition of this state, and say, I'm going to run on that. Oh my God. Just, I mean, today, today he's actually, so over the past like two weeks, they cleaned up all of the homeless encampments and all of the syringes and everything else from the streets of San Francisco because Xi Jinping was coming to town. (laughs) His actual boss was showing up and he's like, we got to clean these streets out. I mean, and and then he's asked about it today and he goes, you know, a lot of people think that, that we uh, cleaned up these streets because, you know, we have you know, foreign dignitaries that are coming to, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> he says, you're right. And he continues on. It's just, it's just incredible. I mean, these people, they just don't care at all. But the, the, the crazy thing is, is that they don't have to, they don't have to, there was a recall election and he won by 70% during the teeth of lockdowns. When, when all of the businesses had been shut down and our lives were utterly ruined, he walked away with a re with the, you know, recall election victory. So like, don't underestimate that guy. No matter how transparently evil he is, he's got a shot. Yeah. I, anytime any of these people, whether it was Whitmer or anybody else, won re-election, I just, I mean, what does that say? That's saying, you, ru- you, you ruined my life for no good reason, and, and, and I approve of that. Or, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm so incurably stupid <laughs> that I couldn't be bothered even to look up whether this did any good. Uh, and, and, and I just trust you because you're the person in charge. I, I mean, I, I don't know what, well, when, when I look at the polling figures and, you know, people are like, Joe Biden is polling at the lowest percentage, uh, you know, for any president at this point in his presidential you know term or whatever. And I always look at it and I'm like, 40% of people approve of this yes, guy. Yes, I know this figure <laughs> is way too high. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it ought to be two. Like how are there how are there forty percent of people that think that Biden's doing a good job? Yeah, or forty percent of people who, who who say this is exactly what I wanted to happen. Oh my <laughs> god, it's so crazy. So yeah, I, I mean, same exact sentiment. I'm looking at I'm like I'm trying to decide. Is like is it Cuomo? Is it Whitmer? Is it Newsom? Who are the worst governors on earth? <laughs> Certainly in America. And and then they go, who are the three people that were considering replacing yeah. Biden? It's like yeah. Cuomo. Whitmer, no, so I'm like, yeah. what is happening? Yeah. Why are the worst politicians actually, uh, you know, climbing the ladder when they should be in prison? It's so infuriating. I hear you, Clint. Um, Liberty lockdown. It, uh, people can listen to that through any platform that they yep. choose. I assume. Yo, absolutely. And uh, also, I'm doing a show over on uh, Rumble. We are change all one word with Luke Rudkowski. We just signed an exclusive deal with with Rumble. So a uh, huge shout out to them for. You know, supporting that, and it's a in studio sh- uh, show in in Miami. Uh, eventually, we'll get Tom on, I'm sure, and and a Thank bunch you. of other people are coming through. It's going to be, uh, you know, basically Tim Cast uh, Florida edition. It's a it's a hell of a lot of fun, and uh, I'm very excited about the things to come. And let me also say, this week I will be on Tim Cast IRL with Dave Smith. It's going to be amazing. Oh, that'll be great. That'll be great. Uh, we'll, Super we'll look- excited. We'll look forward to that. And and by the way, that reminds me, if it hadn't been, I only met Luke once. It was a long time ago. Um, but I met him through the Ron Paul movement. And so th- I, I look back and I think, I met so many interesting people I'm right. still, you know, in touch with today um, because of they, that. They, they just keep circulating around. Yeah, no, I know. I, I think that's, that's the whole argument for, uh, you know, Dave Smith's presidential run that we were all hoping for. It was like, what those movements create is the next generation of leaders. You don't know it at the time. You don't see it coming. You don't, you don't know that the guy who's handing out flyers down at, you know, the ground zero, like Luke Rutkowski, is going to end up, you know, having uh, an audience of hundreds of thousands or millions per month. Um, you just never know. But that's, that's what, you know, lighting that fire in, in you know, 
people in their 20s and early 30s can do. It can lead to uh, the next generation of, of, you know, Ron Paul's. So all hope is not lost, folks. Hang in there. All right. That's a great message to c- conclude on. Thanks a million, Clint. I appreciate your time. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.